Uh, we all know that CD163 is the receptor for PERS. And, uh, and so the idea is, is that if we can knock it out, can we make a PERS resistant pig? And sure enough, Randy Prather uh, developed the pigs. Uh, we brought them at that time, I was at Kansas State University. We brought them to Kansas State and we evaluated and sure enough, these pigs were absolutely resistant to PERS. They could not be infected. And more importantly, is that you could not detect any antibody. So there was no evidence of any virus replication. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson, and I'm the host of the uh, podcast. Joining me in our studios this week is Dr. Bob Rowland. Dr. Rowland is the uh, is a professor and the head of the Department of Pathobiology at the University of Illinois College of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Rowland, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I'm sure some folks have uh, have at least seen your name in some literature in the industry, but perhaps maybe somebody hasn't met you. Why don't you start with an introduction for the audience? Well, my my reputation is pretty clear cut. Anytime I go to a PERS conference and and in the introduction I get is, this is Bob, everybody knows Bob. Uh, yep. <laughs> but with that, I've worked on, uh, actually I've worked on PERS since 1994, more than uh, 30 years. I can tell you there ain't too many of us old folks left, uh, but uh, there's still a few you can find that uh, were around uh, from the very uh, beginning. Uh, over the years, I've worked on a lot on PERS pathogenesis, uh, how the virus causes disease, uh, dabbled in things such as diagnostics uh, and uh, vaccines. Um, the story we're going to talk about today about PERS uh, resistance uh, in, in pigs is really my story. And it really starts out around 2003, which one of the visionaries uh, in um, infectious disease research, Joan Lunny at USDA, envisioned this idea of understanding resistance to PERS. In other words, is there a genetic basis uh, for finding resistance uh, to PERS? And so that's where the story begins. And sometime around 2005, uh, 2008, the National Pork Board uh, came to a group of us and said, look, it, we're still looking for better vaccines but is there a genetic solution to PERS? Can we find naturally occurring genes that can offer resistance? What's interesting is that at that time, a lot wasn't known about the pig genome, and, and yet uh, we got started. And I can say since then, for about uh, 10 years, we did what you might call big science. In other words, we did a project that was so big that over 10 years, we spent about $15 million, huge. You never really ever, you rarely see that amount of money being spent in ag research. And it's a credit to the National Pork Board, to USDA, uh, and to other people such as uh, Genome Canada, who threw in support. And this was a huge project in which we've infected thousands of pigs to find genomic markers that we could use uh, for breeding. And out of that, we found a marker. The thing is that this was not a cure for PERS, but what it did allow is a, a better weight gain uh, during infection. In other words, you can see about a 5 to 10% improvement in weight gain. Again, this is not a, a solution, but it's an improvement in which you can start to get back what PERS takes from you. Uh, so during that period of time, um, I got a call out of the blue by Randy Prather at University of Missouri, and he just said, Bob, you don't know me, but uh, uh, would you be willing? To, I think I have some uh, genetically resistant pigs. Would you be willing to test them? And that really began the story uh, about uh, CD163. Uh, uh, we all know that CD163 is the receptor for PERS. And, uh, and so the idea is, is that if we can knock it out, can we make a PERS-resistant pig? 
And sure enough, Randy Prather uh, developed the pigs. Uh, we brought them at that time. I was at Kansas State University. We brought them to Kansas State and we evaluated. And sure enough, these pigs were absolutely resistant to PERS. They could not be infected. And more importantly, is that you could not detect any antibody. So there was no evidence of any virus replication. So this was really began the, the, the search uh, for a, a PERS resistant pig uh, that you could make using uh, genome editing tools. Now, one of the issues with that is that you're knocking out all of CD163. Viruses are not stupid. Uh, they usually choose receptors that are important to the pig in which case CD163 is important to the pig. And so then the search came, we asked the question, what's the smallest amount of CD163 that we could knock out, retain CD163 function, and at the same time, preserve a PERS resistance? And that's the origin of the uh, genome edited pigs uh, that we see now. Bob, as we think about CD163, um, are there any other um, oh, impacts or I guess roles of CD163 that are important to the pig? Is there anything else that, uh, that we impact good, bad, or indifferent by removing the CD163 from the genome of the pigs? Well, one thing is physiologically, uh, CD163 is responsible for removing excess hemoglobin. In other words, when there's tissue damage and red blood cells break apart, CD163 comes in and scavenges up those molecules and, and get rid of them. That really doesn't affect the pig because most pigs are only around for six months. That's probably not good for a human being especially when you're my age. But there's really no impact physiologically or, or CD163 has no other impact on the pigs. However, interestingly, doing these studies, we asked the question, what other roles can CD163 play? And one is related to regulation of inflammation. And regulating inflammation during production is important. Uh, one thing, inflammation, there are several sources of it. Uh, one is infectious disease. Another source is just plain stress, uh, weaning stress, uh, moving pig stress, temperature stress. There are a lot of stressors uh, during pork, uh, during pig production uh, that have an impact on growth and efficiency. And as it turns out, CD163 may be one of those molecules that regulate this response to stress. And so now we're looking at CD163 in a different role, especially as CD163 edited pigs. Are these pigs better adapted to the modern uh, production system? What about um, other disease targets potentially down the road? You know, we've got the FDA approval now for the, the PERS resistant pig. Are there other um, disease targets specific to pigs uh, that you think will be next on the to-do list for genetic resistance? Well, you name it, and I think we tested it. Okay. Uh, Randy Prather uh, at Missouri, he just went down the list of diseases, uh, the coronaviruses, PEDV, uh, Delta coronavirus, uh, Seneca Valley virus, uh, just about any virus in which there was a known receptor, uh, he went and he knocked out uh, that receptor and we tested it uh, in pigs. And interesting enough, uh, the results are mixed. I think we were very lucky in, in PERS. PERS was just the ideal system in which to examine the effect of knocking out a receptor on, on infection. And we chose right the first time, uh, but since then, you know, some things are a little, um, are a little different. Sometimes you only get partial resistance uh, other times, but overall uh, the approach uh, can really be used for any uh, type of uh, infectious disease. 
How about influenza, Bob? Um, it's uh, big in the news. I mean, obviously, influenza has been a, a pathogen problem in swine for quite some time. It's a problem in humans, and certainly we worry about the high path avian influenza. Is influenza a target for gene editing and genetic resistance? Yeah, it's a huge target, and uh, not so much in, in, in swine at the moment. But uh, when we look at some of those bird flus, uh, and some of them which have been d detected uh, in pigs, yeah, I think it's going to become what you might call a high-value uh, target uh, for editing. You're probably looking at two types of edits. One is to, let's say, affect its ability to interact with the receptor. That's going to be a little difficult to do with influenza, but there are other uh, processes down the road after uh, the virus enters the cell, which require the host pathogen interaction. And so one thing is, is what are those genes? How are they involved? And then what happens when you um, modify their function? Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. What about um, non-disease targets for editing? You know, you mentioned uh, CD163 and its impact on the inflammatory process. Um, you know, inflammation robs pigs from a lot of uh, growth potential and, and, and inappropriate inflammation makes them feel miserable. Are there metabolic opportunities in the future? Well, you know, if you do the simple thought experiment and if we were to grow our pigs the same way for the next 100,000 years, eventually they would become adapted to the system. And they would be adapted in, in terms of optimal reproduction, optimal growth, et cetera. We don't have that amount of time. So the question is, if we can understand those genes that are involved in, you know, things related to stress and inflammation, can we modify them to really better adapt these pigs, basically speed up uh, evolution? Bob, really appreciate the work you've done on it. Um, you know, a lot of people have been working on PERS for a long time, but you've uh, you've contributed with some breakthrough technology here. Very meaningful for the industry, very meaningful for the pigs who are pretty miserable when they've got PERS and for the caretakers, which also have a tough job when the pigs have PERS. When the pigs don't have PERS, they're pretty fun to raise. When the pigs are challenged with PERS, it's not a lot of fun. So appreciate all you've done for the industry with your with your work and your research. Well, thank you for having me. For Dr. Bob Rowland, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. It's been our pleasure to be with you here on the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast. Please have a great rest of your day. Hey, everybody. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health-related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it, share it with us, please feel free to email the research to hello at wisenetics.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at W-I-S-E-N-E-T-I-X dot com.